between my junior and senior year. I was 17 years old and I was driving home from work. The road I was on was 30 miles per hour. It was relatively straight with few turns and there was no one else around. I had my windows rolled up, up, the AC blasting, and my radio on softly in the background. I began to think, what if I just closed my eyes for a minute? It'd be nothing more than resting them. It's all innocent, I convincingly told myself. So I placed both my hands securely on the steering wheel, closed my eyes, car still going 35 and began to count. One, if I'd gone the gas, I could hit the curve sooner. Two, there are trees surrounding the road. Three, I wish I would hit one. Four, I wanted my pain to end. Five, I never wanted to wake up. Six, six, I opened my eyes, not a scratch on my body, but my mind, my mind scarred. I knew exactly what I was doing. I knew that I was lying to myself, and deep down, I knew that this was the first time I started to act on my wish to die. That was the scariest part, acting on something I had thought of for so long, and yet dreaded at the same time. I thought of my family, my friends, the future I would never have, but I just wanted. No, I needed my pain to end. I didn't do it just once, though. I closed my eyes while driving over and over again throughout the entire summer, closing them for longer, speeding up just enough, continuously trying to work up enough courage. I was suicidal. In fact, I didn't tell anyone until nine months after I made my first attempt. Nine months of trying to understand, forgive, and explain, not to others, but to myself. Was, it, was I ashamed of what I had done? Was that the reason why I couldn't share? Was that the reason why I couldn't heal? But it seemed to go deeper than all of that. For nine months, I asked myself questions every day of why I had reached that point. Was it because of one thing or many? If I had done one thing differently, would I have still reached that point? And eventually, it came down to one thing. One misunderstood, complex thing. Mild traumatic brain injury. If you rewind about three years, I was a pretty normal kid. I did well in school, was outgoing, played soccer religiously, and dreamed of graduating high school and playing collegiate level soccer just like my older brother. But during the second week of my sophomore year in high school, I was playing soccer when I fell backwards, causing the back of my head to smack against the turf. I never lost consciousness, but I was so confused. The world spun, my head pounded, and I didn't really know where I was or what was going on. All I remember is red numbers counting down time on a scoreboard and the tears that wet my cheeks. Why I was crying, I didn't know. That was the moment, the event, the experience that changed everything in my life. After a minute, I was able to stand and uncoordinatedly make it to the sideline. My dad took me to the ER where they diagnosed me with a mild concussion the second one I had received in two months. They told me to go home, take it easy, and promise that I'd be better within a couple of weeks to a few months. But after a week, my confused state turned into one of constant pain. My parents took me to my pediatrician, who then referred me to a neurologist, and after seeing the neurologist for about three months, they diagnosed me with post-concussion syndrome, commonly referred to as PCS. At this point, I had debilitating headaches that lasted all day that stayed around a level eight on the pain scale. I didn't get just one type, though. The worst were the ones that felt like I had two or three screwdrivers being driven in and out of different parts of my brain simultaneously. On top of that, I had a mixing pot of symptoms, ranging from problem sleeping to light and sound sensitivity issues to trouble remembering things. I couldn't remember a lot, leaving me with blank spaces that weeks seemed to disappear into. And when I would start talking, my ideas would flee in my mind and leave them half complete or completely forgotten. I felt truly stupid for the first time in my life. I lived my life pretty much laying blank faced on a couch and would attempt to go to school a couple days a week. But when I tried to write, my words would fall off the page and eventually become an incoherent jumble of letters. For the first few months, I got no breaks from my pain. When I would eventually fall asleep at night, I would have dreams of debilitating headaches and dizziness. Even in my dreams, I couldn't escape it. 
You have to understand that I wanted to get better. That every fiber of my being itched to return to normalcy. So I tried everything the doctors recommended. From prescription pills, to acupuncture, from traditional medicine, to holistic approaches. Finally, after seeing my neurologist for about six months, she thought I needed a second opinion. So after jumping from doctor to doctor, I was referred to a neuropsychologist in Boston. Eight months after my concussion, my mom and I made our way down to Boston to meet yet another new doctor. Once I got to his office, he had me fill out this huge packet about my pain, symptoms, and emotions. He then had me do about 10 minutes of brain exercises, like repeating back phone numbers. After going over my results, he told me I was so close to getting better, that I was about 90% <coughs> of the way there, but that I didn't want to get better, that I wasn't trying hard enough, <laughs> that the pain I was complaining about essentially wasn't real or as bad as I thought it was. That's the ugly truth about concussions and invisible illnesses. Just because people can't see them or understand them, they don't believe it. I wish I could tell you I was the only kid out there being told that I was just making it up. But unfortunately, I've met quite a few others just like me. When you're sick and you're looking for any answer you can, you believe pretty much anything. I'm ashamed to say as I digested his words, I believed everything mm -hmm. he was saying. So I started to doubt my pain. Every time I would get a headache, which was all the time, I would tell myself, I'm not really feeling pain. It's not real. I told myself I was hiding some great unhappiness and my pain was the shield protecting myself from it. So I started to lie. Every doctor's appointment, every mention of my pain, I downplayed because I no longer believed it was real. As you can probably guess, doubting my pain probably wasn't the best thing. Just before the one year anniversary of my concussion, two months before my 17th birthday, my pain spiked and I ended up being taken to the ER. From there, I went into an even farther spiral downhill. <coughs> Doctors told me I would either live with pain for the rest of my life or that I would miraculously wake up one day completely fine. <laughs> that could be tomorrow or that could be 20 years from now. I accepted my pain and I lived in a world where I felt completely alone and isolated. But my family refused to accept that I would live my life suffocated by symptoms. But they didn't understand. I had begun to accept the pain. It had become a part of who I was as a part of my life. Altogether, I had a two and a half year battle with PCS. I was in and out of school, barely getting by, and by the middle of my junior year, I wanted nothing more than to drop out. I tried everything to get better. Stimulants, chiropractic care, nerve blocks, a month-long pain rehab clinic. If you've heard of it, I've probably either tried it or heavily researched it. The summer between my junior and senior year, I couldn't take it anymore. That's when the scariest moment of my life happened. That's the first time I closed my eyes while driving. And that's the first time I started to act on my wish to die. I was really lucky though. Two months later, despite my protests on seeing yet another new specialist, I met an amazing doctor and started treatment with him. I went through a three-step treatment process that targeted different parts of my brain and body, and he looked at my illness as multidimensional. He found the root of the problem inside my brain, he really <coughs> listened to what I was saying, and he hadn't given up on me. I spent 11 weeks with him, and I came out cured cured the one thing they told me wouldn't be possible through treatment. He had fixed the concussion inside my brain and yet I didn't believe it. When, you're, when I first got sick, everything I defined myself as was taken away. And with symptoms being my only constant, they became the only way I could identify myself. They became who I was, who I described myself as, and who I thought of myself as. Healing for me wasn't just about physically getting better. It was understanding and accepting my pain, but it was also understanding that I would never get to be the person that I was before it. The truth is I hadn't wanted to see the doctor that I cured me. I had so much anger built up at that point. I was sick of 
doctors lying to me about the, making the promise of them being the one that was going to make me better, being forced into treatment by my parents and having nothing to show for it, and being constantly let down and believing that I was responsible for it all. It took me six months to accept that I was cured. When I first left treatment, though, I had to start slow. I went back to school for about an hour a day. By three months, I was able to hang out with a group of friends and have fun. Five months after I left treatment, I was able to go to school for about four hours, complete focus, no pain. And six months after I left, I had finally accepted that I was better. Today, I'm working about 30 hours a week, and I'm proud to say that even though I'm a couple months behind my graduating class, I'm a high school graduate, and I plan on through hiking the Appalachian Trail this year, and if a college will have me, hopefully attending college next fall. A year ago, I thought the life I have today would never be possible. But today, I'm learning to live and love my life again. Concussions are more than what they seem. They're more than what is portrayed in the media, talked about by doctors, and taught in schools. They're life-altering, unforeseen forces that have a tendency to knock even the strongest down. It took me nine months to be able to share my story for the first time, but it's time for others to understand the true depths of what it means to live with an invisible, stigmatized illness. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it isn't there. And we as a society allow broken bones to heal, but not our brains. I want you to imagine everything you define yourself as, as being taken away. Forced to live in constant pain and having people tell you that it was all within your control. What it's like for kids at school to tell you, hey, I wish I had what you had so I didn't have to do my homework. Or the feeling that you haven't slept in years and yet have a struggle to just get out of bed in the morning or simply leave your house. The pressure of a coach asking you, how are you feeling, too quickly followed by, so when are you back on the field? That's the truth behind an invisible illness. We need to start talking about concussions and not only relating them to professional athletes. They're no small is issue. The CDC estimates that there's 1.6 to 3.8 million sports and recreation related concussions per year in the US, and studies show that 10 to 20% of those last for more than three months up to years. Concussions are mild traumatic brain injuries, a fact we often forget when we're talking about them. We use a fancy word to hide the severity of an issue. We need for our peers, our caretakers, and our doctors to recognize concussions are no small issue and to have patience with us. For others to understand just because someone looks good doesn't mean that they are, and just because they feel okay today doesn't mean they will tomorrow. We need to recognize concussions, talk about them, and as a society accept the problem so we can begin to form a solution. There are many things I'd like to leave you with. But like I counted my fate in that car over a year ago, I want to count the six positive ways we can positively, positively approach concussions as we talk to ourselves or others with them. One, take your time healing. If your body's telling you you're not ready, you're not. Two, no matter your illness, everyone heals at their own rate. That's both physically and mentally and emotionally. Three, be kind to yourself. Four, never stop fighting and don't let others discourage you. Five, don't be afraid to redefine yourself. And six, know that there is hope. Thank you.